Hey everybody, today I wanna to talk about camera settings and how do you actually choose where to place your camera. So when it comes to camera location, I think the biggest and the most important thing is understanding what is the purpose of the image? You know, now with real-time rendering engines, we can produce all these images very quickly, but what's the point of generating all these images if they're not actually useful, right? So I think before you even start placing the camera somewhere or generate a scene, think about what the story is and what you're trying to convey. Is the idea you want to show an overall shot of a project? Is it about a close-up detail? Is it something about the interior or the exterior? You know, these are all things you need to think about before you even hit start. So I'll explain what I usually do. So let's say in this case, you know, I need to do an exterior rendering of the project. And let's say this is a situation where the client just needs to see, you know, what the exterior detail is of the project, right? And this is kind of the use case of the, the image. Are we doing design options? Are we just explaining, you know, certain details? Are we doing sun studies, right? These are all the things you need to think about. So let's say it's something like this, right? Where we just literally need to see a head on view. So although this is an elevation of a building and it's not the most glamorous, the point is I need to answer my client's needs. And that's literally to just portray the details of X here. So knowing this, I'm going to position the camera in a spot that makes sense. And I'm going to go over here to scene list and do that. Okay. That way I have a view here and let me just call this side elevation. Always name your scenes. Okay. So I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to do one that's a little more exciting, kind of like a perspective or like a money shot, just, a you know, add some excitement to the project. So I want to go somewhere where there's like a nice corner. So we've got some, some water here, some details. We've got the landscaping here and I'm kind of thinking about the composition, right? Kind of how everything is laid in the scene. And if you need help with composition, just go right over here to display and turn on grid lines. So the easiest hack I can give you uh, when it comes to composition is these horizontals and verticals. The idea is you want to line them up with something interesting, especially at these intersection points, right? So here I've got some nice strong verticality here. I could sync it with my, my column here, the edge of the building. I can sync this bottom line with the horizon line. And now I've got a nice balance where I've got like details on this side. And then this is all void, kind of like a solid void. So these are all the things you need to think about. And this is what goes into placing your camera, right? So let's say I really like this angle, right? I'm just going to go over and make a new scene. And we'll just call this corner. And one of the benefits of naming your scene, when you go to render it, the file name is going to be called this. It's better than scene one, scene two, scene three. We're all guilty of that, right? So now that we've got an angle that we like, you need to go over here to edit camera. I think a lot of people don't realize that this is actually a button and this is how you edit all your camera controls. This is what's going to expose if it's an active view or picture in picture. So if you don't know what I mean, if I click this, it's now picture in picture, meaning I can move my camera around and it doesn't affect this. So this is good if you need to like place trees or something and you want to see what it looks like without having to be in there. Cause it could be really difficult to do both at once. And you just hit this to activate. Okay. So notice how it brought me back and I know I'm activated because of edit camera and because of this, right? So once we've got that down, we need to think about the exposure. This exposure is equivalent to the exposure here and the exposure in effect. So basically it can be edited in three different spots, right? So always pay attention to that. Uh, if you've watched my videos, you know that I always have auto auto exposure off. I feel like it gets people in trouble. So look at this big difference, right? So this is going to give you complete control. The next thing you need to play with is your projection mode. Now watch this. This is on two point mode. And if you're familiar with ArcViz, you know that two point perspective is always going to give you perfect verticals. So perfectly straight up. If I switch to perspective, look what happens. You see, see right here, you see how this is kind of on an angle and everything is kind of like this. You yeah, pay attention to this tree here and I'll illustrate it even more like this. You see how this is bowing out like that. And that's bowing out like that. Watch what happens when I turn on two point. See how that's perfectly straight. In general, in the world of ArcViz and architectural photography, you always have this on. So I'm going to go back to where my camera was and I just want to make sure that's all on something like that. Perfect. And I just got to sync that. Okay. 
So that's what this guy does. Aspect ratio. So this is the actual cut of your image. So if I do 16 by 9, notice where the black bars are. So this is basically the safe frame. This is what's going to be rendered out. If this seems familiar, you'll recognize it from here. When you go to image mode, you'll see this. These are actually like last minute adjustments. If you have original, it's just going to respect that, right? So it's always good to do this first. That way you're not relying out on it here because each image, let's say you're doing a batch rendering, might have different settings. So you want it to take it from the image, not from here. And keep in mind, you can always change your pixel amount of like the resolution right here. So that's what these guys are. If you don't believe me, you can see it's changing four by three is more of like a, a square, technically a rectangle, right? Um, but you'll see the black bars represent what won't be rendered. And I think the overall cut of the image or the crop really depends on what you're using this image for, right? Like, is this just going on Instagram, right? The one by one format's perfect for that. Is this going in a booklet, right? Is this, you know, does it need to be printed landscape? Is it a poster? Is this something portrait, right? That's what this nine by 16 is, right? So you'll see that the actual focal length is also changing in a way. Notice how this looks very different from this, right? How zoomed in it is. So that's why you do your aspect ratio first before you do your focal length. So if you didn't catch what I mean, let me flip the aspect ratio. Okay, see how we're kind of stepping out and we had at 25 before to achieve kind of like the same look I have to do something like this and it's basically like completely cropping out my uh my camera and that's basically quadruple the focal length so something to pay attention to 16 by 9 i'm so much more zoomed in so it is going to affect your focal length so if you're curious about what focal length is right because i'm talking about it i don't want to say that it is a zoom because it's not it's not a zoom it's just the easiest way to explain that if i lower this you see how everything looks kind of like warped and like fisheye in a way you know you ever go apartment hunting and the, the rooms always look bigger that's because they've got a very low focal length on the camera to make spaces look bigger really powerful for interiors personally i hate when people do that so the human eye is really between like 18 and 25 you know stylistically you know plus or minus several values um i think in general 25 is like the sweet spot that's kind of where i start I think below that, I feel like it kind of, kind of like takes away from the architecture because it's showing so much. And I feel like ArcViz, a lot of it is about focus and the story you're telling. That's why I'm saying like, what is the use case of this image? This is going to affect so much about what's visible, right? So spend some time here and play with them. What I usually do is I will sync a view, right? What I'll do is I'll just go right up here at scene. And I'll try a different focal length. So let's say I've got 30 here. And what I usually do is I'll rename this. And I'll call this corner 30. And then corner 25. And now I can kind of play with them and see what makes the most sense, right? Um, if you are if you figured it out, you could just right click and delete it, right? So that's an easy, quick way of doing that. But again, I feel like 25 is really, really the sweet spot. You start there and go beyond. There are situations where, you know, I do want to do like a macro detail. So something really close up and you see a lot of these shots like in ArcViz. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, let me show you an example. Let's say like, I really want to showcase this kitchen, right? So what you'll see some people do is they'll crank this up to 50. If you're in photography, you know, nifty 50 lens and they'll do something like this. And like, this is a really nice, you know, kind of perspective, lots of focus. And I'm just seeing this. But you can see it's zoomed in, right? Quote, zoomed in, because compared to 25, right? See how much more I see? So that's what 50 is for. Um, again, I use this for close-ups, whether it's like interiors or like a detail on the facade. Like maybe I just want to show the slats, right? Or the roofing here, something like this. This is really interesting angle. And you see what I'm doing with my grids here? I'm kind of syncing up the intersection points here. I've got a nice balance, right? So now that's a beautiful view. So I'll just sync that. And now I have a macro. And I can put a 50 there. That way I know I'm from far away. But again, use these grids, like why not, right? So then the next thing I'll do is I'll think about the camera clipping plane. This only comes up if you've got stuff in your face or your way. So if I were to just pop out here and go back to that kitchen, right? Let me go here. 
And let's say I want a nice close up of this chair, but the problem is I'm so far away, right? So let me activate this view, increase the clipping plane and increase my focal length. And now I'm literally removing model from my view. So notice how I'm outside. This is blocking my view. I increase this and now it's removing it, right? So that's an easy way to get stuff out of your face. Usually deal with this with walls, columns, trees, anything that's usually blocking your view. So here's an example of it blocking a tree or a tree blocking you. Come closer and now it's gone. And now you get the nice little leaves here that act as a vignette. And look at this, you've got like a beautiful shot. And this is kind of another part of it. Just flying around your model is the easiest way to get really nice angles. So when I find a new angle, I hit add scene, I edit it, and then I just play with the focal length until I find what I'm looking for. I like 30 here. I like what's going on with my, my tree branches. It's a little too extreme, but again, this is an easy way to tweak. So I can, I can push this way, push out, come in. But this is my point. They all work together so you can get the perfect shot. So let's go back to the macro shot I was talking about here. Next one is depth of field. This is for your nice, beautiful blur. So when you check mark this, this again is equivalent to this guy right here. I recommend setting it in here instead of here because it's kind of like your editor view and this is like for the actual shot. You don't want to have depth of field when you're flying around. It's like really distracting. So once you check mark it, all you have to do is hit set focus. And then this tells D5 what you want to focus on. So let's say I want to focus on the roof right here. I want this to be in focus, everything else out of focus. Little trick is you could just right click to get out of the autofocus and boost the blur. And now you can't see much of what's going on because I don't have an object in front of me. So let me move the camera just to show you what I mean. So I'll go over here and we've got some leaves here, leaves and grass. Watch this. So I'm going to set my focus to be here, right click. And now look at the blur. That's what this guy's doing. So it's automatically calculating the focal distance and the blur. I don't go beyond seven. 10 is like way too extreme. So seven is like a good sweet spot. And this is going to blur things in the foreground, the background. Again, it's all based on distance and you can see what's going on here. And this follow focus this is good for animations. So that way it's always tracking that distance. But that's what that's for. Then when I'm all happy and done, I go over to my photo mode, which I already have open here. And I have kind of like my last chance to override any focal lengths, any aspect ratios. I'm happy with, you know, what I've set here. Um, in general, you should always double check here because sometimes when you're switching between views, it sometimes changes or sometimes you lose it. Just always go back, make sure it's set um, and resync as always. Okay. Preset size, I'm usually rendering out at 2K, sometimes 4K. It's usually 2K. Channels, this is good if you're doing any post processing. Um, these will render up additional channels. Personally, I recommend Sky Mask and Material ID sometimes transparency, and this is just going to give you extra channels. It makes it easier to select in Photoshop. So a material ID mask will basically make everything super colored and I'll show you what these look like. So let me render this out so you can see all the different maps, but generally that's my preference. It's usually those three, but it's, it's rare that I need to do that because I try to just get everything right in the render engine. So once it's all done, you have the choice of either rendering it, so it'll just render this image, or add it to the batch or the render queue. And that's what this guy is here. So if you have like 10 different renderings and you want to go eat lunch, you send it to the render queue and you batch render at once. So let me hit render and I'll show you all the different channels. And so you'll notice now that I hit render, it says macro roof 50 because it saves the scene name, right? That's the benefit of naming your scenes. So I'm gonna hit save. And now it's going to render out all those different channels. Okay. The rendering is done and this is the raw output. So there you go. This is the albedo. So this is basically all the textures that come out. This is the material mask for the AI enhancer. This makes it a little bit easier for the AI enhancer to select regions. You don't necessarily need that, but again, I'm showing you all the different channels. This is the normal maps. Not necessary. Again, not why I render it out. Hey, yo, this is nice if you want to control like how dark some of your contact shadows are. This is the useful one. 
right? So now you can basically say, oh, I need to make my wood slots darker. So all you do is select cyan in Photoshop, and then you can add an adjustment layer to that, and you'll tweak just that. But in my opinion, just do that in D5, that way all your renders are consistent. Then we have reflections. This is if you want to tone like how intense the reflections, the specular highlights are. Sky mask, this is good if you're not happy with the HDRI that you have or the sky, you can just bring into Photoshop, select black, right? And then just tweak your sky that way. But again, my opinion, do everything in D5. Transparency, again, if you want to tweak glass. Z depth, so this is your foreground background. If you want to darken anything or brighten anything in the background or foreground, you can use this um, layered on, but that's really it. So that's why I'm saying like, I only use sometimes this one, maybe AO and maybe sky mask, but it's really rare. My best advice is just do it in D5 first. Hope that clears up camera settings. As always, if you have any questions, drop it in the comments, leave a like, and please subscribe. Helps the channel out. And if you have any ideas for videos, let me know. I'm always looking for good ideas. See you next time.